You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. This episode is supported by FX's Dear Mama, the saga of Afeni and Tupac Shakur. From award-winning director Alan Hughes, this deeply personal five-part docuseries shares an illuminating saga of mother and son. She was a revolutionary, intellect, and leader in the Black Panther Party. He was a rapper and political visionary who became known as one of the greatest rap artists of all time. FX's Dear Mama premieres April 21st on FX. Stream on Hulu. I'm aware that there are a lot of people who hate me, and a lot of them are Black men. I felt very passionately about R. Kelly. I had stories, you know, he'd approach friends of mine when we were kids. So I felt a way about him for a long time. The amount of backlash I've taken has taken somewhat of a toll on me. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for, by, and about Black culture here at the Griot Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. And today we have a special guest, a person who is not only a friend of mine, but somebody whose career path is one that I followed very closely because she's effectively done the same kind of thing that I've done, but leveled this thing up in amazing ways that um, I think is both a, a lesson to be learned about how to navigate the, the blog world that we kind of came from. But also what it's like being in the, the, the center of the, the eye of the storm in so many ways, just because you're a person with an opinion. She's an award-winning writer. She's a podcast host. She's a former senior editor at Ebony. We'll talk a bit about that. She's spearheaded the, the launch of Cassius, an online e-zine magazine type style space. She was part of the team that brought us one of the, has to be one of the most famous talked about Ebony magazine issues and covers of all time. I know that wasn't purely your work, but you were part of a team that brought that together. She was a part of the Surviving R. Kelly doc. She's written articles about things you have absolutely read if you spend any time reading and discussing Black culture. She's been on TV shows discussing all the things that you and I talk about constantly dealing with Black culture and pop culture. Please welcome my guest today, writer, cultural critic, podcast host, uh, mother, and voice, Jamila Lemieux. How you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Thank you for the gracious introduction. Because I actually looked at your bio on like your website. I'm like, good. You forget how much stuff people have been able to do over time. Like, I don't know how often you go back and like read your own list of like accolades or accomplishments but it is very impressive like you have done a bunch of things and been in a lot of spaces like do you ever just go back and reflect on that like how far you've come from wherever you thought you were going to start wherever you thought you were going yes and now that I'm in a period of sort of trying to figure out what's next I've been doing a lot of reflecting on it well, I'm glad you said that. So I was listening to your podcast, the Mom and Dad Are Fighting podcast, one that you do with Zach Rosen and Elizabeth Newcamp at Slate. Welcome to a very special live Mom and Dad Are Fighting here at Slate.com. We are like really comfortable with watching girls explore things that are typically, you know, coded as male. We're not as comfortable with allowing boys to explore those things. And I enjoy that. You know, you all, it's a, it's a parenting podcast. You all start out with failures or triumphs. And then you kind of address a question that some reader has sent in. And those questions range all over the place. It's very interesting. It's also interesting hearing parents from different walks of life, uh, different stages of parenthood share their opinions on these things. But you mentioned recently something about like not like being in a space where like your career over the past 20 years hasn't had all the guardrails of like getting ready for retirement in like a traditional way. And that like that has been stuck in my head because I'm think I've thought about all of us who started in this blogging space and like where many of us have gotten. So your first blog, I think, was the Beautiful Struggler, right? Was that mm -hmm. is that your first blog? Mm -hmm. Was that named after the Talib Kweli, like in reference to Talib Kweli's album? It was. It was. And then Ta Nehisi Coates titled his first memoir that, and I was salty. <laughs> I actually did like a deep dive to find out where that phrase came from. Like if it had been some kind of like in a book or something like that somewhere before. But 
when you started that blog, number one, why did you start it? And did you ever imagine you'd be where you are in your career at this point? No, not at all. I remember writing about Hurricane Katrina because I had a lot of feelings about that. Um, and then the following year, I had gotten a job. It was supposed to be my job straight out of college as a school teacher. And I failed a class second semester senior year. And so they allowed me to take the job. You know, I disclosed what had happened. Okay, I'm not going to graduate until next semester, but you know, um, what do you all want to do? And they told me I could keep working. And then in October of that school year, I found out that, well, the principal found out that per the No Child Left Behind laws, he had to either tell all the parents of the children in my classes that I wasn't an accredited teacher or it let me go. And so he laid me off. And so I found myself with a severance package of a few months pay and really no idea what I wanted to do. And I took to this blog again and I started writing and I really liked it. And sometimes I would do two posts in a day. I just wanted to write. I just had so many things to say. And around that time, there was this kind of community of bloggers. Interestingly enough, a lot of them DC based that was coming together on MySpace. So a lot of us are publishing to like Blogger, the platform, but a lot of people right. are also publishing on MySpace. And so I think, I don't know if that's where I first found you, but I feel like that might've been around the time where I first discovered your writing and Damon's writing and Kashawn Thompson was blogging. And, right. you know, after a couple of months, I just was like, I'm going to do this. And people had told me that I should have majored in writing and focused on writing in college. And I was like, no, it's not my thing. And I just fell in love with it. And I was like, okay, somehow I'm going to make this my career. And somehow I did. Time for a quick break. Stay with us. And we're back. Do you ever think about like what you could have accomplished had you discovered that talent earlier? Because I always go through, like, I, I yes. wrote my first blog post on my 25th birthday, June 3rd, 2004, was literally the first blog post I ever wrote. And I wrote that because the co-founder of VSB, Liz Burr, encouraged me, so you should be blogging. Based on the instant messenger, con the aim convos that we would have, so you should be doing this. I was like, all right, whatever. So at 25, I started blogging, right? And all of a sudden it becomes a career. And I was like, man, what if I had taken to this earlier or genuinely thought of this as something I could, I could have been writing for the Maroon Tiger at Morehouse mm -hmm. or something. And who knows where I would have been. I mean, and I consider myself successful at this, but you ever like go back and be like, man, what if I had just spent a little more time or tried to do this earlier? Yes, definitely. If I could do it over again, I would have majored in something related to writing. You know, I would have had more of a concrete plan for what I wanted to do. I would have made a lot of things much easier. So I remember discovering you or, I guess discovering is the wrong term, finding, finding your writing. Um, and I remember thinking, wow, this part, because we, I remember this community, you're talking about all these people writing. And it was like, when people had like very strong, um, told great stories, you like, you just latched on and started reading there. Like I would read everybody, I read everybody's archives and all that stuff. And I remember back then I was like, yo, this person who I hadn't met you in person is like, this person's going somewhere with this. I don't know where that is, but this person's going somewhere Where's when was the first time that you realized you could actually do something with your writing? I think the fact that I was able to build community, you know, on my space felt like I was on the right track somehow, you know, that I was able to bring people in. Um, but I think the first moment I had a post that Jezebel reposted and they put kind of a snarky caption on it. And um it was about the inauguration of President Obama. I wrote a somewhat satirical open letter to white people asking them to stay home. Because if you remember, there was all this concern about the crowding in DC, whether there be enough water and bathrooms, this could be devastating. So many people are going to converge upon the city. And I'm like, you all have had 43 opportunities to see this. You know, like, why don't you just let us have this one? And Jezebel reposted it and the white girls were livid. Oh my God, I did more to elect Obama than you did probably. And, you know, it was my first little bit of controversy, but there were also a lot of people that passionately took my side. And I don't know, something about that moment made me feel like, you know, maybe there is something here. Like maybe this could actually be something. 
All right, we're going to take a real quick break here because that's actually a point that I want to talk about. So we're going to come right back here on Dear Culture with Jamila Lemieux. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture. We're here with Jamila Lemieux and we're talking about uh, her start as a writer, culture critic and all of that. And you just talked about the first time you really courted controversy. So I kind of want to talk about a little bit of that stuff. For instance, Ebony. So what, how did you get to Ebony? Like, how did you end up at Ebony? Because that was one place where controversy showed up where I have to give you a lot of props. But I want, let's, let's get to that. So how did you get to Ebony as a senior editor? Like, how did that all happen? It was really serendipitous. Um, I had been writing for a few years at that point, And, you know, I decided I wanted to try to make it work somehow as a career. And I'd done some freelancing for other outlets. I'd written for Essence. I'd applied for jobs at Essence. I really wanted to work there. And I saw an issue of Ebony in Target. And this must have been like 2011, maybe, maybe 2010, but I'm thinking 2011. And Jill Scott is on the cover and she looks beautiful. And Ebony had a new logo, you know, new font, new, like just all new everything. And I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, this is Ebony, you know, because the way it had looked for much of my childhood compared to Essence was visually underwhelming. You know, it hadn't been redesigned in many years. It didn't look modern. They use a lot of stock photography. And so I buy it and I look through it. I'm like, my goodness. And so I'm like, okay, well, if this is what the magazine looks like. They must have a pretty on point website, you know, because at this point I'm a digital writer. So I'm assuming that's where, you know, maybe I can find my way in. And so I go to the website and it is trash. <laughs> like they have not invested <laughs> in this website at all. There is like brown, you know. It was, I remember. It was bad, you know, it wasn't updated daily. And so I'm like, okay, well, they surely you're not going to have your magazine looking this good and not do something about your website. So there's got to be something coming. So I'm going to start calling HR, you know, and figure out how I can get in my foot in the door over there. And so I would call HR maybe once a week and I kept this up for a couple of months. I never reached anybody. And around this same period, I met a woman named Kira Mayo um, at an event she was speaking at and I knew who Kierna was because she was the co-founder of Honey Magazine. Like, Honey was the shit. Honey was essence for a younger generation of Black women, if you will. It was hip-hop inspired. It was bohemian. It was feminist. It was just really, really dope. And a lot of the Black women writers, you know, that I admired had come through, you know, both Essence and Honey over the years. And so... um, and I meet Karen and it turns out she's a fan of me. And so I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe she knows who I am. And she'd been reading my blog. And so she wanted to start a new magazine. And so we'd met up and talked about her starting this new magazine. And so one day she hits me up and she sends me a message on Facebook. And she's like, hey, I know this is going to probably sound crazy, but I just became the editorial director of Ebony's new website. And I get to hire two editors and I want you to be one of them. We're going to get this beautiful redesign, you know, and I want you to come do this. And so she had no idea I had been trying to figure out my way to Ebony, you know. Um, And so it just took off from there. And, And it was, you know, I was there for almost five years and it was quite a run. Yeah, I, I remember Honey, obviously. Honey had the, mo- the probably one of the greatest magazine covers of all time with the Lauryn Hill cover. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I still have that magazine. I'll talk to Kierna about that. Kierna actually has a had a podcast. I don't know if she's still updating it, where she talks about, like, Honey and, like, kind of, like, how they started it and then how it kind of got jacked from them and all that stuff. Like, it was a very fascinating story. Some people call me a legend. I don't know if I call myself that. So I've for sure been in lots of rooms where legendary things have gone down. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but so there was a controversy at Ebony. I, your personal tweets end up becoming this firestorm that create this I stand with Jamila hashtag yes. over an argument with like somebody from the RNC. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I specifically wanted to bring this up is because I remember all of us were going ham online about this. Everybody's dropping the hashtags. It had to be in the tens of thousands. Like it was crazy, right? But it seemed like it, it was taking you a while to release a statement. And then when you released this statement, it might have like legitimately been the most thoughtful, well-written, calculated, like measured response I've ever seen in my life responding to a controversy. It both acknowledged the space that we were in or that you were in, excuse me, as a person who is 
an individual representing a brand. It talked about how much love and respect you have for the brand and what has provided you. Because everybody was kind of like, man, down with Ebony, forget Ebony. If they don't want to stand up and everything. And, and then you kind of come and took all the air right out of that with like, listen, this is Ebony. <laughs> like, this is a legacy. This They gave me an opportunity. And I had to think about these things. Like, I reread that thing recently. I'm like, man, I don't think I could ever write anything that good in my life. Um, Thank you. Was that, so one, props on that. Like, legitimately, I don't know if I've ever told you that, but it really was one of the, like, the the most well-written responses to anything, like, controversial I've ever read in my life. Dude, was that, like, the the first real big controversy, like, that you faced? Yeah, that was. That was, I mean, after the Jezebel What kind of thing, learning experience was that for you, by the way? It was quite a learning experience. You know, one thing I really had to contend with at that time was how vulnerable Ebony and other Black media platforms were you know, because of money, because advertisers who don't always understand the nuances of Black conversation and, you know, things that young Black girls say on Twitter um, are the ones making decisions about whether we can print this thing or not, you know? And so me kind of having this offhanded, you know, conversation with this young Black Republican, I'm not thinking much of it, but the stakes were very high. And so um, it took me a while to release a statement because I was told not to say anything, which drove me crazy, you know? And finally, when people turned on Ebony, it was like, okay, she's got to say something, you know? And they realized like, okay, maybe apologizing to the RNC, which is what Ebony did, was not the best move. Maybe we should allow her to speak on this. Because I felt like it could have gone away sooner if they let me go on the news. Because, like, it was on MSNBC, it was on Fox. Everywhere. And they wouldn't let me go on, you know? So other people were going, other Black thinkers were being, you know, dispatched to come in and just talk about it. I'm like, well, I wish I could really talk about what actually happened because it's being taken out of context, you know? And, um... But it it definitely taught me a lot about representing a brand, you know, and the mindfulness that you have to have when you represent something that is bigger than yourself. You know, other people work here. This brand has been around, you know, since 1951. I have to respect that. But at the same time, still, you know, standing on my morals. And, um, you know, I maintain that what the GOP did was willfully distorting my words to try and make a point. A couple of years later, Sean Spicer, I think it was Sean Spicer, he was the communications guy for the yep. RNC at the time. So he and Ryan's previous were a part of this, you know, and um, they had came after me and they'd come after, really they were coming after Ebony. I was not the big joker. The big joker was that it was Ebony, of course, but, you know, that meant coming at Ebony through me and they come after Melissa Harris Perry and they explained that what they were trying to do was prove to black voters that they were willing to fight for us, which I just think is so interesting that attacking, you know, visible black women was the way that they wanted to prove themselves to black voters. You know, I thought that said a lot. I've done and written some controversial things. I found my way in the middle of a couple things here and there, but I've literally never been in the middle of a, uh, like political battle and then been realized I'm being used to try to create this narrative that's clearly not accurate, but over time it kind of the narrative kind of shifts to this kind of thing seeming like it it works in later, you know, in later elections and stuff like that. Like what does that feel like to be in the eye of something like that? Cause I genuinely can't imagine having an entire political party coming for me um, in such a fashion. It was really isolating, you know? We're coming up on, this is the ninth anniversary of it happening right now because my daughter's birthday is tomorrow and I remember this was all happening a few days before her first birthday. Um, And so I'm still in new mom mode, you know what I mean? Like I'm still overwhelmed by that and trying to make sense of that. And so now there's this thing going on and like it went on for about a week and like, it went on for a few days without most black folks knowing because it was just me getting attacked by all these Republicans. So, and then when I was asked to stop responding, like people aren't seeing me tweeting about it and they're not seeing the Republicans because they don't follow them. So they're not really getting wind of it. And so it was like, I was going through it all by myself. And Kierna really had my back. Kierna and I are very tight, like 
she's just my person. We have a very special relationship. And, you know, just telling me everything's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. But like, I was afraid I was going to lose my job. You know, because the leadership right. at Ebony at the time was not terribly social media savvy. So, like, it looked to them like I had been doing some crazy shit and I had started some trouble. And so it was just really, really isolating. And I think that if I could do a lot of things over again, I would. But I wish that I had talked more to my friends about it. Because my friends weren't Twitter people, you know, and this was even before, like I had a community of Twitter people and, you know, over the years, there would be people I would do panels with and, you know, I, I get used to seeing them and they were Twitter famous too. And like, we would talk about what that felt like, but for the most part, I kind of kept that experience to myself. So it was just very lonely, you know, and like seeing people say all these horrible things about me and not being able to respond to it. And then my loved ones not really knowing what's going on. I would just say it was very, very isolating. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about hopefully what ends up being a positive spin on the aftermath of that uh, right here on Dear Culture. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture. I'm here with Jamila Lemieux and we're talking about her career and what it's like being a culture critic and being somebody who is a voice for a voice that sometimes has been controversy on on occasion. But as any of us who spent time speaking truth to power, we like to believe that this is our calling in some ways. I'll, say, I'll speak for myself anyway. But you go from Ebony to Cassius, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's an okay. interactive one. And an interactive, interactive one, we one. launched Cassius. So how did that come about? And let me add to this. I remember that was one of the first times I remember seeing something and I was like, yo, they are really coming for it. There were radio spots for Cassius. Uh, there were, I mean, I don't know if there was any commercials for it, but I remember hearing like every hour on the hour, a Cassius radio spot. I was like, yo, this, they're not playing. They're not playing. So two questions. One, how did you, how did y'all come up with the name Cassius? I'm assuming that's a reference to Muhammad Ali, but I could, I'm, I'm assuming, um, like, why did you all settle on that? Or how did you all settle on that? And what was, how did you all, how did you get there in the first place? Are you being headhunted at this point? Or, you know, was it just like, you were like, you know, I need a new challenge. So I definitely had a few other offers and opportunities, you know, to leave Ebony while I was there. But Kierna, um, who had been my boss and who had been the editor in chief at Ebony, she left. She went over to Interactive One and became the SVP of, you know, digital programming, which means she was running all of I1's websites. And she brought a few of us with her, you know, maybe four of us came over from Ebony and it was scary, but it was exciting. And, you know, I also worked on News One's website and I was part of the team that launched Cassius. Cassius was Kierna's, the name, it was really her baby in a lot of ways. Um, so she, uh, I can't remember the exact thinking behind Cassius. I think she likes the name. And then she said, you know, before you have a Muhammad Ali, you have a Cassius. You know, that's an important stage. That's something to acknowledge, too. Uh, and, it, and it sounds like something. You know, it just sounds like something. And, you know, what I was brought there was to do was to build a comprehensive lifestyle website for Black men. That was my goal. That was my dream. I'd always dreamed of launching a site for Black men. Um... I just felt like it was just such a missed opportunity that there was nothing like GQ or details or Maxim that existed for brothers, you know, post King. Um, and I felt like even King, you know, like everybody likes titties and ass and rims, you know, and rap music, but there's more to it than that. You know, like I think about being a young guy who's just graduating from college and he's going out to business dinner and he doesn't know how to order a glass of wine, you know, or what's the difference between a cognac VS and a VSOP and why does that matter? You know, where do I go to, to get relationship advice or, you know, to read about black men's health, you know, in, emotionally, spiritually, you know, physically, otherwise. All right. Where'd you go? Where'd you go from there? Did you go to like another specific place or were you just back on the freelance stuff? Like, what were you doing? I haven't had a full nine to five since 2018. Um, and I'm at a point now where I'm like, okay, I think I need a nine to five again. I think I need a job. I need 
I, 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 you know, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know where to go. I don't know what I want to do full time again. I produced a docu-series that I can't talk about yet because it hasn't come out yet, but I worked on that. I've appeared in a lot of documentaries. I did Secrets of Playboy um, and the follow-up to Surviving R. Kelly. I was in the first two and freelancing and making it work. Let's take a quick break and we come back. I want to talk about the Surviving R. Kelly doc right here on Dear Culture. We're back here on Dear Culture with Jamila Lemieux. So I want to bring up three things. So Surviving R. Kelly doc, very polarizing, right? As polarizing in the black community as you can get. You wrote an amazing article about Chappelle's The Closer. And then you wrote, I think last year, towards the end of last year, about Meg The Stallion and all of the, like, the, the split on how we treat how Meg the Stallion was treated because of what happened with her and Tori, right? And I mean, he'd been convicted since, and you still have people blaming her for this type of thing. So these are all things that in the black community, like, and I'm just going to like, like Chappelle, R. Kelly, Meg the Stallion, which is really Tori. We call it Meg, but it's really Tori doing this. But like, you've had all these very strong, like strong articles and things that you've written about this stuff. Like, do you expect some of the like the blowback from it or like when you go into writing these things is the goal just to make sure you get the story and the narrative that needs to be out there out you know i just try to say what's on my heart you know um i have strong opinions i think since i was a very little girl i've had this gut feeling about how black women are sorted in our society how we're treated how we're viewed how we're um, not protected. And, um, you know, it's led me to speak out against, uh, or to be critical of some beloved figures, you know, at times. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised by the controversy at this point, you know, I, I can anticipate it, but I try not to think about it too much. You know, that's the downside. That's the part I'd rather not deal with. And because I'm not as active on social media as I used to be, I don't have to deal with it on the same level as when, you know, the during the Black Twitter heyday, where you would also then go on and spend the day debating this stuff with people. Um, now I can kind of publish something and, and move on from it. But um I try not to think about the controversy. I do think that the amount of backlash I've taken has taken somewhat of a toll on me. Um, and there were a few years during my career where I wasn't publishing very often. You know, I went from being really prolific and always having a hot take and always having something to say to, you know, I think being kind of distracted with other work and, you know, I was doing a lot of speaking gigs. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And it just kind of took me away from what mattered most to me, which was the writing. And so now the writing is my focus again, um, but I, I really try not to think too much about the controversy. When you say it's taken a toll on you, like what kind of like what kind of toll was that? You know, when you I found the Facebook post where you posted the Cosby cover and you said something real interesting in in the caption, which was, you know, if you love it, don't give me all the credit because I was part of a great team that did this. But if you hate it, you can give me all the credit because I can handle it. And I thought that was so interesting because it's like, man, you willing to take you willing to take the barrage of, of of all of that on. And I imagine it has to be difficult. Like, you know, you're doing good work. This is not, you know, you're literally speaking on. I mean, these are hard conversations that we need to be having as a community, especially when it came to the Cosby thing. So I, you know, I feel like you have taken the brunt of a lot of conversations that we're having like globally in our community, so to speak? I think I did. I think I broke down a little bit. I think a lot of people around 2018 broke down, you know, like that 2012 to 2018 run of life was just a lot. And for people who are working in media, I think just from the death of Trayvon Martin to the Ferguson uprisings and the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement and the beginning of Me Too and then the rise of Trump, you know, it was a lot to take in and to be somebody who had been commenting on those things, you know, um, I, I think I was a bit just sort of overwhelmed and kind of burnt out after a while. Um, 
you know, in terms of the toll, like I'm aware that there are a lot of people who hate me, who hate me, you know, and a lot of them are black men. And when I, you know, the moments of controversy I had with the GOP or with the Jezebel thing, those were white folks. And I don't expect white people to love me. I don't expect them to like me. You know, I just don't have the same relationship to white people that I have to black men. So while I don't want to be controversial or hated or, you know, attacked by Republicans or the right wing, um, that's kind of par for, you know, like that it's almost as if to be expected with that demographic. But the idea that black men would hate me for calling out black male predators is devastating because one, you know, I'm the one saying these guys don't represent the whole. This is not what the average black man looks or, or behaves like. This is not who we are. This, you know, we should be isolating them and calling this behavior out as exceptional and unacceptable, you know, unacceptable. And um, to have people say, no, I want to defend that. You know, you're the problem. You're the one causing problems between us. But like, no, I'm simply advocating, you know, primarily for black girls and women, but, you know, also for victims in general, because like when it comes to Cosby, most of the victims weren't black, but, you know, I still didn't think that these women's dignity and, and rights to their body was worth sacrificing because it was a beloved black man who had violated those things. You know, I wasn't going to throw those women away in order to save my favorite TV dad from when I was seven years old. Time for a quick break. Stay with us. And we're back. How did this surviving R. Kelly thing happen? Like, how did you end up in the dock? Like, I know you've spoken on the R. Kelly at, at length. I mean, that's it's it was out there. It's kind of a shame that it took all of this time for this to happen. And, and do you feel like vindication? I mean, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of pain that's had to occur to people to get to this point. In 2019, R. Kelly was arrested on federal sex crime charges. I'm ready to just tell my truth. What's your overall thought, I guess, on all of that from the doc and, and what's happened since and, and, and the role that you may may have played in, in, in helping get a predator convicted finally for something? Dream Hampton reached out to me. She was the executive producer and the director of the first Surviving R. Kelly and we had, you know, become friends from Twitter and knowing people in common. And she was another writer I'd grown up, you know, admiring and was really excited to connect with her through Twitter and all that stuff, you know, and she knew I was from Chicago. So I felt very passionately about R. Kelly. I had stories, you know, he'd approach friends of mine when we were kids. So I felt a way about him for a long time. I mean, even through Aaliyah, I never be, I was never a big Aaliyah fan. And I think part of it is just when I was, when she comes out, I'm super young and like, she's a little older than me. So I have this kind of respect for her as a big kid, if you will. But I'm like, she's dating a grown man and everybody's okay with it. Like they're on TV wearing matching outfits. Like nobody's challenging this. The man is on the album cover. The album is called AJ, nothing but a number. She's 14, 15. Like what is happening? You know, that was like just such a tremendously confusing moment for me as a young girl, um, their relationship. And so I had a lot to say about it. I'd written about it and I had been one of the people who, you know, had used Twitter to get out the word about him. And like you say, polarizing, it's interesting how like the tide has turned drastically, has turned, yes. you know, <laughs> but like now. there was a time where like getting on Twitter and dissing R. Kelly was not cool. You know, like there were a lot of people that were going to come after you. There were a lot of women, you know, a lot of men, like a lot of people were going to be defensive of him. And, you know, whether it was, what about the parents, you know, those little high head, fast ass girls, you know, whatever excuse you could think of, it was being made. It was being made for a long time. And then there were people who didn't necessarily feel the need to defend the behavior. They just wanted to continue to enjoy the music. You know, they wanted to support him and play his music and put him on movie soundtracks. You know, like we watched The Best Man Holiday 
over the holidays this year. And that movie came out in 2013 and it ends with an R. Kelly song. A new R. Kelly. That was like a new track made for the movie. You know, and we're talking about the tape coming out, the rape tape in 2001. I was in high school. You know, so like my whole life, it seemed like I've been watching this man be a predator and it just seemed like no one cared. And so I was really honored the dream thought to include my voice in the documentary. And I was very proud to do it. And I was very, you know, happy that it led to the state's attorney in Illinois, Kim Fox, opening an investigation, which led to a successful prosecution. Earlier today, Robert Kelly was indicted before a Cook County grand jury on 10 counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse involving four victims. And there was a successful federal prosecution, you know, and there are other states that are pursuing charges against him too. And, you know, it was finally over and it took so much. You know, there were so many of us, you know, there's the sisters who started the Mute R. Kelly movement, you know, like they were very central to this, you know, shutting down concerts, taking money out of his pocket. Um, it, it took a lot of hands, but it, it finally happened. So maybe it's more polarizing even now. I still find myself in debates with people about it. And I think you're, it's all about the music. People are like, well, I just don't think I have to, I have to give up. I'm not supporting him because I already bought it a long time ago. So I'm just playing the music. Or I'm, it's, you know, it's such an interesting conversation. But, you know, I guess there's always going to be those kind of folks out there who uh, can separate the man from the music kind of thing. And, I, you know, for a lot of people... I stopped wearing my Yeezys when Kanye went too far. You know what I'm saying? And that that's that's a problem because I'm getting older and those things are comfortable. You know, those are some very comfortable shoes. That that Adidas boost is very comfortable. But you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta pick a side and and and, and be you wanna be on the right side of history. So, you know, all those efforts are definitely very much appreciated. Um right, we're gonna take one last break. We're gonna come back and I'm gonna ask you about your book. See, I promise not to overdo it with the book thing. And then we're gonna close out with some black fashions and black recommendations like we always do here on Dear Culture. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture. I'm with Jamila Lemieux, and we've been talking about uh, her career, her journey. But like most of us who have been bloggers and writers, there's always that looming question of, where's the book? Are you going to write a book? Uh, I get that question all of the time. I get that question at other people's book events. And I'm not even sure these people want to read a book that I'm going to write. I think they're just asking because that's what you ask writers, right? Like, where's the book? You, though do have a book in the pipeline. I wanted to write a book for many years. I've been saying for years, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write a book, you know, and I never sat down and wrote the book and or the proposal. And it took me like five years. I had a literary agent, you know, and we worked on numerous proposals and we get started on an idea and I just couldn't finish a proposal because I didn't really believe in the idea. And then we'd start another one. And finally, you know, my agent convinced me to focus on single motherhood. Um, and I'd run from that, you know, I think part of it was still me running from my own shame and running from my own conflicted feelings about it, um, which is why I needed to run toward it, you know, which is why I think this book is necessary. I mean, there are not, there's not a lot of public exploration of black single motherhood. You know, what is talked about in public is the idea that we are what's wrong with the community that, you know, if black women could stop having babies out of wedlock, we would be in a better place as a people, you know? Um, but there's still considering that we do make up the majority of the mothers in our community. We are raising the majority of the children, um, there's just little interrogation into our lives and to what it means to us to be single mothers and, you know, kind of like what we need, what we feel. Um, and I wanted, you know, I finally was like, okay, I can write about this. So it's a book of essays, but this is largely about what it means to be a black single mom and what it's meant to me. All right. Well, I look forward to it. You're a, uh, you're a good writer. Always have been. You've always been very provocative. Uh, you get the people going with the things that you write. So I imagine this book will be no different. Uh, again, you know, and because you're very popular amongst a lot of for good and bad reasons for amongst the, our community, I imagine this book is going to do well. So I'm going to be very excited when this comes out. All right. Well, we've come to the the last the last segments of this show, which are some of my favorite, because it's an opportunity to do the thing where black people love to say we're not a monolith. So this this is where we prove it. 
we do a black fashion, which is a confession about your blackness, which is effectively something something that people will be surprised to know about you because you're black, right? Uh, do you have a black fashion for us? I do. All right, what you got? I have never seen Jews nor Minister Society. How? I don't, I don't, you know, I told somebody that for the first time last week and I felt like a weight had been lifted off my chest. You know, I think part of it is those movies came out when I was a little girl, you know, and so my mom okay. was not showing me stuff well, like she that. she shouldn't. <laughs> you know, and I don't remember them coming on TV terribly often. Um, and so I just somehow never saw them and have yet to have like the impetus to be like, OK, let me go out and watch them. And I'm curious about them. But I'm also like, I mean, I saw Boys in the Hood and I was devastated, you know, like Ricky died. Like, oh, Ricky! You know, for years, I have, I actively avoided movies with death. Like, I've never seen Titanic. Why? I know how it's going to end. I've never seen My Girl because people told me that the boy got stunned by being died. You know, like, yes. so Thomas. to watch these. Yes. So, like, to watch these movies where I know a number of people are going to get shot up in front of me. Um, I just haven't run to that. The way that the way that you feel about like Boys in the Hood and seeing Ricky dying and how that hurts, that doesn't happen in Menace Society because you don't care for the characters the same way. It's pure nihilism. Like it's 100 percent like it's all bad from day one and never gets better. I would just be curious about your perception of Menace Society watching that, because I have argued with people. I actually put this on Facebook. I think Menace Society is terrible. Uh -huh. like, I, now, I now have I've gone completely 180 and I think it's actually a bad movie. Uh mm -hmm. It's effectively a Tubi movie just made in 1993 before we had all the other options, so we wouldn't know any better. Wow. Um, after we ask people for a black fashion, we usually ask people to give us a black recommendation, which is a recommendation about something by for and about blackness, black culture, whatever that you're interested in, you're paying attention to, that you're up on now. Do you have a black recommendation for us? I do. Um, I am going to recommend a book called Ride or Die by Shanita Hubbard. It's just a really, really great look at the idea of the ride or die chick and what it's meant to black women and how we have, you know, self-sacrificed in the name of our men in a lot of ways and kind of how we've been expected to do that by popular culture. And she loves hip hop deeply and she's, you know, makes excuses for it, but she's also willing to hold it accountable and to talk about how it's really, you know, shortchanged Black women. It's just a really great book. Easy read, quick read, great book. Jamila, thank you so much for being here on Dear Culture. Uh, thank you for the work that you've done, the work that you will do, for your voice, for everything that you've brought to the cultural conversations that we have. Where can people find you and keep up with you if you want to be found um, <laughs> and whatever you got going on. I'm quiet these days. I've got my head down working on the book, but you can hear me on Mom and Dad are Fighting on Mondays and Thursdays via Slate. And I do the Karen Feeding Parenting Advice column on Fridays for Slate. I still have my Twitter account at Jamila Lemieux and Instagram. I don't post very often, but I'm still there. If you want to say hi, you can, you can find me. I'm still checking. Thank you so much for being here on Dear Culture. We appreciate your time, uh, your conversation. And thank you, listeners, for checking us out here at the Grill Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. Have a black one. <laughs>